James Bond. James Bond. Diamonds are forever They are all I need to please me They can stimulate and tease me They won't leave in the night I've no fear that they might desert me When creating an ongoing film franchise, you'll sometimes end up with entries that fail to resonate with audiences at the box office. That's not necessarily a remark on the quality of the project, just that not every film is going to make the money you hope for. You then have two choices moving forward. Take a risk, or play it safe. For example, while many love it now, Temple of Doom was considered polarizing at the time. And so Steven Spielberg and George Lucas decided to play it safe for The Last Crusade, and that worked in their favor. I don't need to go into Lucas's other series, but that's another case where safe entries often came after risky ones, and sometimes that worked, and sometimes it backfired. Terminator, Star Trek, Alien, Iron Man, Planet of the Apes, Jurassic Park, Spider-Man, you name it. Virtually every franchise has had this quagmire at one point or another, and sometimes it happened a few times. After the lukewarm reception to Honor Majesty's Secret Service and George Lazenby's walkout, Cubby, Harry, and the United Artists found themselves in a bit of a pickle. They once again had no James Bond, but now they had the additional challenge of figuring out what to do with Majesty's ending. That film clearly paved the way for a follow-up to have a revenge-driven plot to pursue Blofeld. And yet it seemed at the time that the public might not be terribly interested in going that direction. Plus, Lazenby had failed to win over audiences with his portrayal. So Cubby and Harry set about trying to find a new Bond, and seemed to have found their man, John Gavin, who was actually signed and announced as the new Bond. However, United Artists weren't happy with the choice, and were hell-bent on getting Sean Connery back. They managed to convince the actor to sign on for just one more film, the deal included the record-breaking sum of over a million dollars, plus a percentage of the gross, and production backing for two films of Connery's choice. Now with Sean in place, the film seemed to come together, and it was clear that the producers had made up their mind at this point about what to do with Diamonds Are Forever. Let's play it safe. After seemingly dispatching Blofeld for good, James Bond is given a rather drab assignment following a smuggling operation through to its head. He starts by impersonating a smuggler named Peter Franks and meets with Tiffany Case, part of this pipeline. She is currently in possession of a large shipment of diamonds and is about to head to Las Vegas to pass them along. Under the guise of Franks, Bond goes with her and discovers that the trail seems to lead towards Willard White, an entrepreneur who has not been seen in person for five years. Upon further investigation, Bond discovers that it is actually a very much alive Blofeld operating in place of White and using his company as a cover for his operations. So with a diamond smuggling scheme on one hand, and a renowned laser refraction scientist on the other, what could Blofeld possibly be up to now? I'll start off by acknowledging this film's reputation. For the general public, this is just another random Bond film. No different than something like Tomorrow Never Dies or The Man with the Golden Gun. It doesn't have a lot of notoriety about it, so I don't see many having strong opinions. However, amongst Bond fans, it's a different story. Diamonds is often a candidate for one of the weakest in the series, and I've often seen this film placed at the bottom of a lot of lists, alongside Dine of the Day or some of Craig's outings. I have my theories as to why this is, and I'll get into those in a bit. But I would like to make it clear that while this is definitely one of the weaker films, I wouldn't call it terrible. In fact, I think it's about as low as you can go on the quality spectrum of Bond films before it becomes a film that I dislike. I think it has several merits, but it definitely has its deficiencies as well. And I can totally understand if this is a least favorite film in the series for you. I think the main reason it gets reviled is because of two aspects relating to its position within the franchise. It's the very next film after Majesties, and it's Connery's return to the official series. 
if you're a fan of Majesties like I am, then you were probably disappointed that such a rich storyline like Bond getting revenge on Blofeld for Tracy was dismissed in favor of a lighter tone that starts to skew towards broader comedy. If you didn't like Majesties and were instead excited by Connery returning to the role, then you were probably disappointed that such a restrained adventure was the vessel for him that seems to be a world apart from the first five films. In that sense, I'd say Never Say Never Again is a more appropriate fit to market Connery's return to the role. Despite it being a remake, Never Say Never Again goes all out in places and makes sure that Connery's return is celebrated throughout. I think Diamonds works better as a standalone film divorced from those aspects and when taken as a standard lighter Bond adventure, but it is such a missed opportunity on either front as well as not quite measuring up to the standard of quality that the series is known for, that it tends to dig such a pit for itself when compared to other Bond films. I also find it hard to forget that this is the last time that we'll see Blofeld in the official series until Spectre, with one exception. This rivalry has been built up since From Rush With Love, and arguably since Doctor No. If anyone is the official nemesis of 007, it's Blofeld, and we never got to fully pay off that mounting tension. Especially after they adapted Honor Majesty's Secret Service, I figured it would have been a given that the marriage would matter in future films. Apparently, Richard Maybaum did write a version of Diamonds where Bond went after Blofeld for Tracy's death, and I'm so sad to not live in a world where we got a satisfying payoff for that. As much as I love the pre-titles in For Your Eyes Only, I don't think that confrontation should have been relegated to an opening scene that's fairly disconnected from the rest of the movie's plot. I'm perfectly aware of the legal troubles that surrounded Blofeld, and that's why he's largely absent from the series after Connery's run, but I figured that would have only forced the producers to be aware of the ticking clock they had on the film rights to the character. I've spoken before about the producer's tendencies to tackle each of the entries as its own entity. And while I'm generally okay with that, Diamonds represents the biggest problem with that ideology. If audiences thought of Blofeld as the same man through each of these films, then some continuity is to be expected. By deciding to virtually ignore certain characters and events, the producers shot themselves in the foot. Again, this is somewhat okay for most of the films and if you're watching them out of order, but when films from the same series bring back a character for a story and expect you to bring over your investment from past outings, then I think it's only fair to expect that all of those adventures featuring the character should count. Can you imagine the confusion if you went into Star Trek 3 and Spock was alive right at the start and with the crew acting like nothing had happened to him? There certainly is more than a slight hint of the absurdity in camp that would sometimes rear its head during some of the later films. I've even heard this film called The First Roger Moore Adventure, and I would agree with that entirely. Characters like Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd, Plenty O'Toole, Bambi and Thumper, and Mrs. Whistler seem like they would be more at home in a film like Octopussy or Moonraker than something from the Connery era. The police chase, the dune buggy, some bits at Circus Circus, and Blofeld and Drag especially seem like they are from a Roger Moore film. Now I'm not saying that to knock Roger's films, I'm quite looking forward to tackling them next in this series, but just to say that I feel like the filmmakers were starting to move towards that new style for Bond films, and that doesn't play the Connery strengths. I wouldn't go so far as to say that he was miscast here, but that perhaps the film would have been a better fit for someone else. That said, after a one film hiatus, it's fun to have Sean Connery back, and it's clear he's enjoying himself a bit more this time around. It's not quite up to what he was doing in the first three films, and there are times you can tell he's going through the motions, but when it's accompanied with that classic Connery flair, he's the coolest person in the room. Scaling the outside of the White House is a classic Bond moment for me, and the subsequent scene with Blofeld's reveal is my favorite scene in the entire film. It's efficient in its dialogue, stylish in its look, and mixed with that essential element of danger. We know that Bond is at Blofeld's mercy, and this is the most I feel like Charles Gray is playing the same man as Donald Pleasance or Anthony Dawson. 
I would say that the film greatly benefits from Connery's presence and makes it a far more enjoyable film than it otherwise might have been. On the subject of Blofeld, Gray is one of the strangest casting decisions I have seen the series make. It's not that he couldn't make for a great villain sometime down the road, but not only does he not fit the mold of the past two Blofelds, and it's odd that Spectre isn't even mentioned in this film, but Gray already did a memorable part in You Only Live Twice. His Blofeld often feels like another entity from the others, and that's mostly due to the direction the filmmakers went in. By going for a lighter tone, Diamonds tends to fall into the camp territory a lot, which I'm fine with to be honest. But watching this film in sequence, I just can't make a case for Grey being a terribly interesting iteration of Blofeld. He is fun to watch, and Grey certainly isn't doing anything wrong with the part. However, this is the least interesting of all the main villains we've had so far, and he lacks the menace or the genius I feel the character should exude here. That said, I do enjoy bits and pieces from his performance when I just go with it and accept it as is. Jill St. John's Tiffany Case is a Bond woman that won't be to everyone's tastes, but I enjoy her immensely. She brings a rougher, more brash American charm to the role, and she and Connery really click for me. Not as well as somebody like Pussy Galore, but still really solid. I also like that she's just part of a longer smuggling chain and not exactly the most important link. But my favorite thing about her is that she has this sense of duplicity. For a while, you don't know which way she'll swing. She's never really an antagonist, but you don't know if she's going to stick around with Bond in the next scene. She's one of my favorite parts of this film, and it's nice to see that one of Fleming's best leading women got a decent transition into film. In the other Connery films, I always felt as though there was a clear difference between the film and the book versions of the leading women, and I often felt like the literary versions were weaker than their cinematic counterparts. After Dame Diana Riggs fantastic turn as Tracy in the last film, Tiffany was never going to quite measure up to that standard, but she's a great companion for this adventure. The other standouts in the cast are Bruce Glover and Putter Smith as Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd respectively. They are just so much fun. They have a slimy politeness about themselves and their nasty line of work. Glover says that he was pretty much just doing Peter Lorre, and I think that's very visible. Mr. Kidd is the weaker of the two, but I wouldn't dare separate them. I like the visual contrast, and I like them being gay. It doesn't really make a difference to the story, but it adds distinction to them, and I look forward to each of their scenes. There's something about their writing that reminds me of some of William Goldman's style of wit in his scripts. It's not to that same level, but they share some things in common. On my henchmen ranking list, I put these guys outside the top 10, which was a tough choice. Watching Diamonds again, I think I'd maybe bump them up a spot, but my top 10 was so crowded that I don't know who I would have left out so that they could be there. I think that speaks more to the fact that this franchise has too many fantastic villainous characters to pick from, and Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd have definitely deserved their honors as part of that group. There are a few fun presences in this film alongside the leading roles. Lana Wood's Plenty O'Toole feels like a nothing character in the story, but she does add personality to the middle section of the film and she's fun to watch. The impact of her death, I feel, was botched completely due to the actual death being cut out of the film, but that's not her fault. Jimmy Dean is a lot like Charles Gray in that he feels like an out of left field casting choice for the film but I do like him as a different kind of ally to Bond, and like Jill St. John, he brings an American charm to the film. I can't say much about Bruce Cabot and Joseph First as Burt Saxby and Professor Dr. Metz respectively. They function within their roles fine, but don't stand out much. The real tragedy, though, is casting someone like Cabot in a role that doesn't give him much to do. If you don't know who he is, he played the romantic interest to Fay Ray in the original King Kong film and has appeared in over a hundred films afterwards, with Diamonds being his final film role. It's a shame, really. Norman Burton is now the fourth actor to play Felix Leiter, and he's one of the blandest that we've had so far. After Jack Lord, it feels like this series had the hardest time trying to find someone who can inject some life into Felix and have casual audiences remembering the character from past films. 
Apart from John Terry in The Living Daylights, I think I can safely say that Burton is my least favorite version of Felix. MQ and Moneypenny are still continuing the good work they've been doing since the beginning, and while Moneypenny only gets three lines, she continues to delight. I'm glad that Q is starting to get a bit more used here, and by the time we got deep into Roger's era, Q cements himself as a smile-inducing presence in almost every outing. Due to Connery's overwhelming salary, I think the production takes a step down in order to accommodate its reduced budget. While this film has a bit more money to spend than Majesty's overall, that film also didn't have to spend a million of its $7 million budget in order to secure its leading man. Ken Adam returns for production design duties, and while he has some great rooms here and there, nothing stands out here like they did in the previous films. The action is also quite plain. It's not that it's terrible, but it feels uninspired in many places. The car chase around Las Vegas has a cool stunt that drives me nuts every time I see it, but the rest of it feels mundane. This is the first of four films where we get to see Bond involve the local police in a chase and their cars get wrecked in a more comedic fashion. It's too reminiscent of Keystone Cops for me and it takes me out of the film. I think the best use of the gag is in Live and Let Die, but even there, there are a couple of bits I would have cut. By the time Diamonds Are Forever was released, Keystone Cops was over 50 years old and must have felt a bit dated by this point. My favorite action bit in the film, by the way, is the elevator fight between Peter Franks and Bond. It's a great setting due to its claustrophobic nature, and I feel like the scene makes great use of the possibilities you could do with it. Plus, the actual fighting feels like a nice callback to something like Grant's fight with Bond in From Rush With Love, thus making it one of my favorite Connery fight scenes. As per usual, John Barry steps up to the plate and delivers a fantastic score. It's not as emotionally driven or hard-hitting or risky as Majesty's, still one of his finest efforts in my mind, but it adds some much-needed class and danger. This and Thunderball are the scores that come to my mind when I think of classic John Barry Bond. The title song is absolutely pitch perfect for me. I've just always had an affinity with this one, and I think it's due to Shirley Bassey returning and the mysterious hypnotic melody that starts the song. It's hard not to be drawn into it and enjoy it. It's a close rival to You Know My Name for being my favorite title song of the series. The actual title sequence is probably the most overtly sexual that we've had in the series up to this point. It's never been quite my favorite Maurice Bender effort, but there are some great images here, such as the women pushing the diamond on the two sides and the cat coming in and out of the titles. I'm of two minds about the writing. This is the first of three films credited with Tom Mankiewicz as writer, and he did some uncredited work for two others. And after having spent quite a bit of time with his writing in the first two Superman films, I must say that I generally like his style of dialogue. There's an elegance and wit about several of his scenes, and when played by smart performers, it shines. However, I do take issue with the plot construction of the film. It's perhaps the most low-key of the film since Dr. No, and it does drag quite a bit in the middle. Bond continues to investigate the pipeline from Amsterdam into Vegas, and there's no real big revelations that the audience is going to care about until Blofeld shows up again. Plus, there's a lot of showcasing of the Vegas culture that feels extended, like in Circuit Circus. It's not even like Guy Hamilton is doing that much unique with his directorial choices to spice up the picture. It makes for a rather laid-back style of film, and while I generally don't have a problem with that for Bond, remember that Thunderball was also a very laid-back film, there needs to be something else to help carry it. For Thunderball, I felt like there was a certain style and elegance to the filmmaking that was matched by the exotic setting. Here, I feel like Vegas doesn't quite match the intrigue and elegance of a place like the Bahamas or Istanbul, and so it's easy to get bored at times. Part of that may be because I'm fairly familiar with Las Vegas, I've been there several times in the last few years for one reason or another, and I've even stayed at Circus Circus when I was a kid long before I got into Bond, so some of the mystique is lost to me. Now Vegas can certainly be a glamorous city, I think the Oceans movies have done a great job at portraying the city as such, but in Diamonds it seems a bit dull in comparison to other cities. I'm not even sure this is entirely because I've visited it because I have also gone to places like New York, Paris, Venice, and Cortina, and yet I find that those fit right at home with Bond's world. 
There's a sleaziness to Las Vegas in the 70s when it was still a mob town. I feel like the mega resorts now lend themselves much better to the elegance of Bond style, and so maybe this is just a case of unfortunate timing when choosing this setting. Despite all of my complaints, I have a good time with Diamonds Are Forever overall. Many Bond films have their problems, and some of the more problematic ones like For Your Eyes Only and No Time to Die rank quite a bit higher for me. So I guess it all depends on an individual arithmetic that only makes sense to each person while watching a film. I certainly understand why some people seem to really hate this one, but I find that it's one that I tend to stick in on more than one occasion. Other than No Time to Die, Diamonds is probably the Bond film I've watched the most in the last three years, and I've enjoyed the experience every time, though each viewing isn't without some slight boredom. Diamonds is not a shining example of the series like its name may suggest, but I really don't think it deserves quite the hate it gets. It's sandwiched in between too much better films, but I find that each and every Bond film has something to be enjoyed about it. Some of the things I like in Diamonds are some of the tastiest of their respective categories, like Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid, or the music. And thus this film is an example to me of the pros and cons of playing it safe within a franchise. It did seem to pay off at the time, as Diamonds Are Forever was one of the highest grossing films of 1971. Critics seemed to be more positive about it than Majesties at the time, and so James Bond as a franchise seemed to still have some life to it. And with Connery once again bowing out, we could go on to introduce a new actor who would carry the series for a whole new generation. I know this probably makes more sense to do after Never Say Never Again, but Diamonds marks the end of Connery's run with the official series. And since I didn't do one of these for David Niven, the only other actor to portray Bond in an unofficial film, I thought I'd go ahead and do it here. Sean Connery cannot be praised highly enough for his contribution to James Bond. He's the one that got the series going, cemented the blueprint for the cinematic incarnation of Bond, and for many is the only one that comes to their heads when they think of the character. All of the actors to come afterwards have been measured against him, and each has acknowledged his influence on their takes. Despite my personal preferences, I cannot thank Connery enough for getting this series started on the right foot. He brought the style and danger needed for the part. He had a timeless animal magnetism about him that made him both the coolest and the sexiest person in the room. He also knew how to play the dry humor, he handled himself well when he went about his business, and he makes for a believable secret agent, so you have a complete vision for an enduring character. It's hard not to sing his praises when watching one of his films, and it's equally hard to ever imagine another actor supplanting him as the perpetual popular choice for the best actor to play James Bond. However, not everything about his performances or his films are timeless. This is a bit of a sore spot for some people, and I know not everybody likes the idea of watching these films with modern lenses, and I get the arguments. They were made in the 60s and played to the 60s standards. It's a little like taking Tarzan out of the jungle and then criticizing him for not measuring up to modern society's ideas. It's a bit silly. What does it matter if he smokes or drinks a lot? Him killing a lot of people in cold blood is part of the character and I don't have a problem with him using his sexuality as part of his tool set. But the things that I dislike are things I can't look past, and I've talked about a couple of these in other videos, so I won't bore you with relisting those same issues. But suffice it to say, it's a lot like when I rewatch classics like Gone with the Wind, Dumbo, Forrest Gump, or Saturday Night Fever. There are just some things that were wrong then, and they are wrong now that leave a bad taste in my mouth in otherwise good to great films, and thus it sours the experience. Nevertheless, none of this seriously hurts the fun of watching Connery as Bond. He made it seem effortless a lot of the time, and even when he wasn't invested in the part and delivered subpar performances, he still managed to rise above many other cinematic icons, Thankfully, other actors have come along and proven themselves worthy of wearing the tux and sipping the martinis, but Connery had to carve the way forward through the forest, and that's not a small challenge. Ian Fleming's works can be cinematic, but they are often experiences that work better on paper than anywhere else. 
And so we needed someone who could transition us from literary Bond into something that was more appropriate for the screen. Whichever version you prefer, I am confident that the James Bond series would not have become the cinematic juggernaut that it is without Sir Sean Connery being the first to portray 007.